Great. Thank you everyone for joining us on this very windy, blustery, dark evening. Uh, we are still energized because we're in the presence of greatness. And, um, and I really don't say that lightly. Um, it's very rare that you come across um, people who are dedicated to their work, research, transforming healthcare, but are also really hardworking individuals. Um, so Dr. Surgeon has been operating all day, all day yesterday. And when I rang him in the 20 minutes before the webinar to try and just help him get on online, he was trying to put his two kids to bed. So um, it's it's no mean feat doing all of those things. So we're really grateful for your evening and very grateful that you have been one of the fertility doctors and helped us to really just navigate some of the more complex issues in gynecology, um, including extending our, our really great team. So, so Dr. Surgeon Sasso is a gynecological surgeon. Um, it's one of those things where I think I think your namesake de defines who you are, surgeon, because you definitely um, fell into your namesake by becoming a surgeon. And in today's world, I think we are, you know, really lacking individuals who can dedicate so much more, but are also really challenging the status quo. Um, so, surgeon, will you do us a favor and just give us a little bit about your background and um, experience to date. Of course, thank you very much for inviting me here today. Uh, it's an honor to be part of Hertility. It's an honor to be in front of all you and our audience. Um, a little bit about me. So my name is Surgeon Sasso. I am a gynecologist who works at Imperial College of London in West London. Uh, at the same time, I'm also a gynecological surgeon who uh, specializes in gynecological cancer surgery and complex benign stuff. Uh, in addition to that, I have a passion for ultrasound, so diagnostics that are related to gynecological pathology or gynecological ailments, um, and also a passion for looking after young women where you have to treat the pathology or treat the symptom, the illness, whatever may be happening, but at the same time, try to preserve that patient's fertility. Um, I work, I've been now with fertility for three years, two, three years. Uh, it's been a fantastic journey. Um, and I'm delighted to be here tonight. Great. So we've got a lot of questions. We put out some questions to the audience prior um, to the webinar on Instagram and had a lot of questions coming through. Um, our aim is to really just cover as many broad top topics as possible. Dr. Surgeon has put together um, just a few slides. In the first instance, I'm just going to share um, our screen here. Um, let me know if you can see this. Um, great. So in the first instance, I think we are on a very shared mission to revolutionize healthcare for women. Just a few words about what Hertility does for anyone who is new and doesn't know what we do. We have built a very comprehensive online health assessment that helps us to effectively triage you for over 18 of the most prevalent gynecological conditions um, and, and, and hormone imbalance, fertility, uh, onset of menopause. These are all things that are very indicative that, that are symptoms, biometrics, lifestyle factors, but also menstrual factors and previous medical history can be very powerful predictors of these pathologies. And how we confirm that is through an at-home blood test where we tailor a panel of hormones to the individual, what our dedication is to ensuring that you essentially have this first half, the, the top half of this wheel uh, from the comfort of your home. It's like three appointments in one, that screening, the blood testing, and then the report, the report whereby um, our team of gynecologists have written a letter. We have, um, we take into account all of the different things that we've tested. We explain each of the hormones, why we tested them, what they mean for you, and what are your actionable insights? So what are the things that could have caused, caused any one of your hormones to be either elevated or deficient and out of range? So we have all of the actionable insights and the next step. So we don't leave anybody um, waiting. So we have a full team of clinicians that you can book in to speak with. Dr. Surgeon is one of them. And then really what's front and center for us is being able to, to build this community of people who really care um, with diagnosis times averaging at three to four years for PCOS and seven to eight years for endometriosis. It really is high time that we have better effective screening and testing tools to enable people to get to a diagnosis. Dr. Surgeon, you mentioned about some of the, um, the people you've had on waiting lists. This um, idea that we would be able to 
answer and be asked some of the most intimate questions about our gynecology, answer them in an online health assessment, be able to speak to gynecologists and actually be able to receive referral for fertility um, surgery, ultrasound scanning, or receive a prescription is really where healthcare should be, but actually just doesn't exist at all. And it's what we very proudly have built at Hertility. So we're going to look at some of the things that the test can tell you, but really after that, what are the things that you should be looking into from a surgery perspective and beyond? Um, interestingly, we see that almost 70% uh, of women who do a test with us have at least one out of range hormone. And because the symptoms of hormone imbalance are quite insidious, we actually rarely get to the bottom of it, but this test will help you do to do so. Now we, um, Dr. Surgeon, you're going to talk a little bit about why we could book a pelvic ultrasound scan, but I want to I wanted to um just resurface something that you said that has really lived with me. So we know that about six hundred and seven thousand women are on a guy are on a wait list just to see a gynecologist in the UK. It's the longest wait list of all um, medical specialities within the NHS. Um, and you said that previously you used to you used to see patients with you know stage three, four cancer, maybe once a year, and now you see them maybe once a week. How has this impacted your, your service? And if you, if you want to just maybe start with the, the importance of why we should all be checking in, whether it's starting with a blood test or a pelvic ultrasound scan. Uh, thank you. So when it comes to gynecological cancer, there are obviously a number of different cancers that a woman can be diagnosed with. So cervical cancer, which is the most common worldwide gynecological uh, cancer. And the mutual cancer is the most common gynecological cancer in the UK. And ovarian cancer is the most lethal uh, gynecological cancer. Due to a number of uh, reasons, societal, economic, COVID, et cetera, our waiting lists have ballooned over the last uh, two years. Uh, and you're absolutely right. Uh, our waiting lists are longer uh, as a result. But uh, at the same time, we are... Um, facing a number of a good number of women who are presenting late with uh, their pathologies. Ovarian cancer is the kind of really scary one, the one that uh, uh, always makes me the most concerned. The reason being is that it's a it's a cancer where women tend to present late. So if there's anything to highlight, number one, and, that, and this is true for anything, um, but in terms of your symptoms and signs, etc., because main thing to highlight, do not ignore your symptoms. doesn't matter if you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Of course, very unlikely you'll have cancer in your 20s or 30s. Uh, there may be other conditions going on that affect your quality of life. Do not ignore your symptoms. Um, Could you just um, highlight some, what are the main symptoms that people should look out for? Yeah. So um, in, specific to cancer, anything to, such as heavy bleeding, irregular bleeding and abdominal bloating, are probably the most uh, common ones. I don't want to scare uh, our the audience who's listening. Again, unlikely that you will have cancer if you're in if you're within your reproductive years. Um, however, symptoms like that can affect your quality of life anyway. So heavy bleeding, regular bleeding, uh, and abdominal bloating. The great thing about fertility is that you can get um, a, a that that previous slide which I love the, the whole concept of a one stop gynecology clinic. You can have your uh, blood test. You, you can then see a specialist to discuss your symptoms in conjunction with those uh, blood results. Um, yeah, so those, I mean, those are the, those are the main symptoms uh, that I would, uh, I would focus on. So you mentioned a one-stop gynecology clinic. It's what we've endeavored to create this end-to-end -end service. What are the things that you think are uh, most important to look out for in terms of just routine management of your gynecological health? Um, you mean with regards to symptoms or? Yeah. So I, again, being vigilant is, is key um, in terms of uh, symptoms going forward. So let's, let's put away cancer for a bit. I think anything um, that's related to the menstrual cycle, that's not how it should be. That's not normal for a patient. And what is normal, it's very individualized, should be taken seriously. One of the things I get very frustrated by is when you, when I see women who have been waiting uh, to see a gynecology for six months, nine months, even 12 months, or something like painful periods or heavy periods. Um, I think it's so, so important that that gets looked into. And, and 
if you're suffering with that, if you are, if that keeps happening over and over again, please don't uh, ignore it. Please keep persisting and persisting. And if you, if the GP is not an option, we have this wonderful service that's being created uh, by uh, by Fertility. Um, again, going back to symptoms: heavy bleeding, forward slash, uh, irregular bleeding, abdominal bloating are to me the most common uh, two types of symptoms. Great. Thank you so much. So we're going to get to some questions because we've had quite a few. Um, and obviously you are one person who has had a, had a, has a really busy few days, but we'll try and get to some of the questions. Um, lots and of then... questions in the chat, by the way, just to... Pardon? Yes, there's lots of questions already in the chat. I'm keeping an eye. Um, <laughs> so first question, basics about ultrasound. When's the best time in my menstrual cycle to have a pelvic, pelvic ultrasound? So... Uh... Ideally, that ultrasound should be done within the first half of a menstrual cycle. So most menstrual cycles last for 28 to 30 days. Uh, ideally, that ultrasound should be done in the first half. So from a fertility perspective, to look at the antral follicular count, ideally uh, day three, day four. Uh, with regards to uh, certain symptoms that a woman has, the again, the first half allows uh, the doctor who's doing that ultrasound or the sonographer who's doing that ultrasound to get the best picture. For example, if a patient has bleeding in between her periods or has a sudden three, four month history of heavy periods, a common uh, cause of that could be an endometrial polyp or a submucosal fibroid. Those are usually best seen in the first half when the endometrial lining is thin. So you can imagine a, a, a kind of a good uh, um, descriptor to, that everybody understands is the whole concept of mowing, mowing a lawn. In that, in that first half, the grass isn't, hasn't grown very much. So any uh, pathology or for, from a garden perspective, weeds, for example, would have grown. You can see them and uh, diagnose them quite easily. There's a joke in here about bushes, but I won't make it. <laughs> <laughs> Trimming your bush. Okay. Um, that's great. That was you who said that. <laughs> I couldn't help it. Okay. So then we have a question about... Um, What's the research behind fertility clip dropping off or fertility dropping off a clip after 35 with more babies being conceived later in life? Does this hold true? So uh, excellent question. Very important question. Um, we live in a society where uh, for all the right reasons and quite, quite correctly, um, women are, uh, are going to work, are going to university, want to have a career. Uh, however, there is this I concept from an evolutionary biology principle where unfortunately the ovarian reserve drops so the number of healthy uh, eggs that a woman has starts to drop off um, from the first uh, time a woman has a period so whatever that may be 12 13 14 however from the age of 35 36 37 onwards the number of those eggs does precipitously drop and the quality of those, of those eggs drops that doesn't mean that a woman cannot have a baby after 35 as that second question correctly says, um, more babies are now born in London above the age of 35 than below the age of 30. However, um, that uh, doesn't mean that there is there is no fertility drop off. The yeah, there's, there's happening... no real there's no real cliff. It's like this spectrum, yeah. right? Of course, sure. as we get older, um, but I, you talk about mowing laws. I talk about um running marathons um if you were to put your bet on somebody running a marathon finishing and recovering successfully um and i do think that recovering successfully is, is key um getting pregnant carrying a baby delivering and being and, and recovering successfully uh, is equally um you have reduced odds at a younger age or reduced odds at an older age than a than a younger age and we know also from a chromosomal perspective that our chromosomes um a bit like our skin um are less good at segregating well and so we have a higher incidence of abnormal chromosomes or abnormal eggs the older we get so while you don't stop being fertile at 35 there are people for whom they have low egg reserve at, in their 20s there are people for whom they spontaneously conceive in their you know in their late 30s right. Um, right. and that's part of our mission is to help people better understand their own own um fertility their own limitations because so many of the um uterine ovarian factors that come into into account when dealing with 
fertility. Um, and I think that's, again, part of this whole ethos around checking in around not just your ovarian reserve. And you mentioned the antral follicle count, which is the number of follicles or would be eggs in each of your, each of your ovaries, but also the health of your um, of your lawn. <laughs> Sorry, I had to bring on the analogy. Um, okay. it's, worth, it's, it's worth saying that it's not just just on that point. It's not just about uh, fertility. Um, remember, that, or the quality of eggs, the number of miscarriage, the uh, risk of miscarriage, so to speak, also increases. So in your 20s, it's about 20, 25%. In the 30s, it's about 30 to 35%. Uh, antenatal issues. So when a woman does fall pregnant, the number of complications that can arise due, due to that pregnancy can also increase. The risks can increase above the age of 35 and especially above the age of 40. So there are a number of factors that can be challenging for a woman uh, when it comes to pregnancy later on, uh, later on in life. Uh, and it's something to be thought about and considered uh, going forward. Absolutely. Um, now, we actually have a number of questions in the Q&A as well about PCOS. So we'll take a few minutes for PCOS, but just start with how do you know if you're ovulating if you have PCOS and have irregular periods? Uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, remember, with irregular periods, with PCOS, that can range... Anywhere from 20, a cycle every 30 days, 40 days, 60 days, 70 days, 80 days, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's very difficult to know if you're ovulating and you don't really know if you're ovulating. There's no, uh, there is no way that somebody will be able to tell. Um, if you have a menstrual period, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have ovulated. What does that mean when it, with regards to trying to fall pregnant and having polycystic uh, ovarian syndrome? Number one, go and get properly checked out by a gynecologist, have an ultrasound and have a blood profile, a proper PCOS blood profile as is offered uh, by, uh, by fertility. Um, get a, I get a proper consultation. When it comes to active trying, the advice is usually for any couple that are trying, sexual intercourse three times a week, uh, not just uh, sporadically or from time to time, three times a week, the sperm stays inside um, a woman's body for about five days and the egg only for 24 hours. So if you want to give yourself the best chance with the regular period, periods to fall pregnant, uh, sexual intercourse every um, uh, three times a week. Now, what, what's, the, what's the big difference between a woman who may have PCOS or confirmed PCOS and somebody who doesn't? The guidelines usually say 12 months of active trying. If nothing is happening, get referred to a fertility specialist. With PCOS, you should go and see your GP uh, or um, to sorry to get referred to a fertility specialist after uh, six months. That's the that's the key with regards to PCOS and falling pregnant. And we here at Fertility we have a number of uh, different fertility specialists with whom we work uh, to make that link if necessary. Great. So there's another question. Um, just looking for here. Um, there, was one, there was one about PCO and PCOS. I don't know whether that was, that was in the chat or it's one of the yes, slides. Yes, go for it. Go for it. Remember, this, this is a really important concept and it causes a lot of anxiety for women, young women. This, you know, 21 years old, the woman has an ultrasound scan and she's told she has polycystic ovaries. And suddenly she's pathologized. She's made to feel like a patient. Um, and, uh, and, you know, there are anxiety issues and, 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 and concerns going forward. Big difference between polycystic ovaries and polycystic ovarian syndrome. Polycystic ovarian syndrome the Rotter, so-called Rotterdam criteria, Rotterdam, the city in the Netherlands, Rotterdam criteria defines it as having two, at least two out of three of the following characteristics. So an ultrasound, yes, that, follow, that, that points towards a polycystic ovaries. Number two, clinical symptoms, acne, excess hair, uh, irregular periods. And number three, a certain blood tests that also point towards polycystic uh, ovarian syndrome. You need two out of three at least, to have PCOS. Just having polycystic ovaries uh, does not mean you have PCOS by themselves. And actually, I hate the term polycystic ovaries. I think they should be called multicystic or multifollicular. Also, that if you're trying to diagnose PCOS and you're within eight years of having had your first period, the ultrasound is irrelevant. Within the first eight years, of having had your first period, women are expected to have either irregular periods or to have loads of follicles. So actually that ultrasound is irrelevant. Let's say you have your first period when you're 13 years old and you get a scan at 19, which tells you you have polycystic ovaries. It's irrelevant. From 21 onwards, that ultrasound 
counts. And I think actually it shouldn't be polycystic ovaries. The term should be multicystic or multi follicular. You have young women who are fit, female athletes, uh, low BMI, training all the time. Who will have who will be who will have multicystic uh, ovaries? So big difference. PCOS and PCO. I hope that clarifies things a little bit. Absolutely. And I think I, I think you're right. Terminology really matters because actually when when we say polycystic or many cysts, actually there's no cysts at all. It's just that you're referring that's to exactly fantastic. You're referring to the, the appearance of the ovary and it oh I, I just so happened to have my trusty uh <laughs> ovary here. Um oh, and it looks like there's maybe, multiple maybe this on my consultations. It's brilliant. This is this is great. This these are my favorite things. Um it looks like I'm I'm eating something, but um yeah, it's actually the the appearance of what look like cysts, but it's not. These are the individual follicles that contain uh, immature eggs, um, and that definition I I agree is very misleading uh, when it comes to defining something. Correct, correct. And that, remember that cyst, the polycystic cyst. People think cyst. It's oh my god, it's something dangerous. It's all again terrible. But follicle is better than cyst. All it means is little immature follicles that are not matured yet. It doesn't mean you have these, because I get women asking, oh, where's my cyst? Where's my cyst? It doesn't mean that there's like some six, seven centimeter cyst that needs to be removed. So yeah, anyway, uh, that's, yeah, that's all about PCOS. <laughs> Next question. Okay, great. Okay, contraception is a big, is a big question because we're witnessing more and more people who assume that when prescribed hormonal contraception, that this is almost um, a, like a band-aid approach. Um, and I certainly think that more investigation needs to happen in younger girls with irregular periods before they're ever put on hormonal contraception. However, what we're seeing as a result of that, as you said, ex and we medically we anticipate that someone would have irregular periods from you know the, their first period for the first few years. And we're we're putting young women on hormonal contraception. If they're put on, if if somebody is put on hormonal contraception to mitigate the symptoms of irregular bleeding, painful bleeding, heavy bleeding, hormonal acne, um, low mood, weight gain, any of these are really things that you don't necessarily want to welcome back into your life. And so time and time again, almost every single day, I hear people who said, I have been on my form of contraception since I was 15. They're now in their 30s. So this is a real example of one of those questions. Should you have a break from the contraceptive pill, especially if you've been on the pill for at least 17 years? This is a very difficult difficult question to answer at the end of a very long day. <laughs> but if I, if I may attempt to answer it. So I, I completely agree with you. There should be an individualization with regards to advice related to contraceptive uh, pills or any type of uh, hormonal uh, contraceptive. What does that mean? Number one, are you getting the contraception for just contraceptive purposes or have you been given it to because of a pathology uh, or certain symptoms? For example, heavy bleeding, irregular bleeding, painful periods, um, uh, international bleeding for, of no apparent uh, cause. If it works for you and you're very happy with it and you've had significant issues in the past, then why would you want to stop it? I think that every woman who would like who would like to have a baby at some point should stop any type of hormonal contraception at least six months uh, before attempting con uh, to conceive. There is no strong evidence, you know. There's also a guideline that says this, but in my mind, six months is a, a decent time to find out what what are your cycles like, to get in the zone to start conception what does that mean you know, improving quality of life high protein low carbohydrate diet improving your sleep minimal alcohol speaking to your partner making sure the partner's on board it's not just kind of the woman doing what she needs to do and the partner <laughs> lives their life and, and doesn't do anything um so six months at least um and uh if if so num number one six months at least to take a break before trying uh, to conceive if you've had significant uh, significant, some significant symptoms in the past or diagnosis, let's say endometriosis or fibroids or issues with your menstrual period, then I don't think necessarily you should stop the contraceptive pill because it's obviously helping you and helping your, helping to improve your or maintain your quality of life. And then third thing to say here, and I think this is what this question is hinting at, there are some significant, there are some risk factors related to long-term use 
with the uh, hormonal contraceptive pill. Uh, in particular, uh, increased risk of breast cancer, increased risk of cervical cancer, although reduced risk of ovarian cancer. When we talk about increased risk, reduced risk, the overall risk, the absolute risk is still not uh, significantly high. Um, and that's an, imp an important concept. Yes, there is an increased risk, but the absolute risk is still, isn't this some kind of huge jump? So the bottom line is, if it works for you and you've been using it for a while, an example is endometriosis. You know, women who struggle with painful periods, painful sex, three, four, five, six years, are finally starting on something hormonal and that works really well for them. Why would, you know, why would they stop it? I think stop it at a point when you want to um, try to conceive and then and take it uh, take it from there. And the final thing to say, I hate when women are started on hormonal contraception just as a, you know after a first consultation, almost like uh, you know you're paying for pills. Here's a pill. I I think these are uh, important symptoms. I think there need to be there needs to be a diagnosis of some sort, uh, and I think the non hormonal non pharmaceutical approach is also key here. Um, what's your quality of life? How much do you exercise? What are you eating? What's your BMI? Have you seen a pelvic physiotherapist? Is there a bowel issue? For example, is pelvic pain, is there a bowel issue that's ongoing here that needs to be looked at? I, I mean, I we know that our menstrual cycles are our sixth vital sign. So they've been recognized as being one of our vital signs along with our pallor, our temperature, our pulse, our, our heart rate, all of these things. Our menstrual cycles are very powerful indicators for our overall reproductive health, but our overall health too. And that's because our body relies on so many of these hormones um, and relies on them in a, in a cyclical manner. And so I, I really do think that it, at, at, to your point, I, th I think everyone should come up and just check in on their own body and and see what their what their underlying symptoms could be in the absence of a mimic. That's, that's, you're right. That's the gray area. So, for example, if you were started on a pill at the age of twenty four, uh, contraceptive reasons, not because of certain symptoms or because you were diagnosed with a condition, then, um, like you said, should you check in? And that's the gray area. I, again, I'm not I'm not a woman. I'm not. I, I, I only say this from consultations. And it seems sensible to me that if you are not in a relationship and contraception is not important, then why are you taking the pill? At that point, stopping the pill, checking in with your cycle, checking in with your periods is, is something I would advise. Great, thank you. Okay. Oh, surgery. How do I prepare <laughs> for my surgery? What questions should I ask my surgeon, Dr. Surgeon, uh, before going through surgery? Um, so preparation for surgery. Um, there is a physical uh, aspect to this and there is a psychological aspect to surgery. And I always, uh, you know, what I always tell my trainees, there's no such thing as an easy surgery, a difficult surgery. There's no such thing as a minor or a major surgery. Every operation should be taken seriously and every preparation operation should be prepared for by the surgeon and the surgical team and by the, uh, by the patient. I think if there is an operation coming up, um, there is a, uh, a slightly longer term preparation period. And my advice with that is to focus on diet. So cut down on carbs, improve, increase on protein to build it for, uh, for the operative uh, period. And also most, surge, most gynecological surgeries do tend, to be, um, do tend to involve entering the abdomen and you want to keep the bowel as, less, as minimally bloated as possible. Obviously carbohydrates increase the bloatedness. So I would uh, advise that the carb loading isn't, isn't uh, that heavy. Um, psychologically, I think it's important to fill your, surround yourself with friends, with family, with things that you love doing on a day-to-day -day basis, um, so to, to go into that surgery with the right frame of mind. Most of the time, surgeries are fine. You have it. It's done. You recover. Occasionally, there can be complications, and you want to, um, sorry, going into an operation with the right frame of mind allows you to cope with a complication in case of that were to happen. In terms of questions that you should ask your surgeon, I think it's important to ask about uh, the preoperative period or should I do before surgery? We've discussed that. What's going to happen during the surgery? So what kind of scar will you do? What will you do uh, once you're inside? What are you removing? And what do and then what do I expect in the first day or two after surgery? 
Uh, final question is slightly longer post, uh, a slightly longer term post-operative recovery. So a week or two or three weeks after, how long will it take for me to recover? Especially if this is abdominal surgery, keyhole or open, doesn't matter, but if you're entering the abdomen um, uh, to treat whatever needs to be treated. Great, thank you. So much surgery now is laparoscopic. Is there a is there a set recovery time from laparoscopic surgery? Is it, it everything depends on what you're what you're doing inside? Uh, so so I said again. Apologies. Everything is laparoscopic. Tell me. Yeah, everything. I, I suppose everything is. Out, everything is laparoscopic now. Are there set expectations wow. that someone should anticipate from you know a laparoscopy going through the belly button versus in multiple places? So, uh, well, not, not, you're right. The most common gynecological surgery is either going to be hysteroscopic. So this is when it's done uh, through the vagina. Uh, the camera goes through the vagina, cervical canal, enters the enters the womb, takes some biopsies, remove a polyp, treat a fibro, et cetera. Um, that's done as number one. Number two, laparoscopic surgery, pretty common to treat an ovarian cyst, to treat endometriosis, and then for study more... Um, a major type of surgery to they remove the uterus, remove the tube and ovary, treat cancer, etc. And then the final uh, type of surgery is obviously open, which involves a midline incision or a transverse incision. And again, that we, that can be for benign, i.e., non-cancer or cancer uh, causes. Laparoscopic surgery usually involves uh, three or four holes. Those holes can be uh, five millimeters to ten millimeters. One in the belly button, one above the pubic bone. And then one or two at the uh, kind of side parts of the pelvis, so left and right part of the left and right aspect of the of the pelvis. You that of course there are variations to that, but those tend to be the most common. So so back on the um going through the cervix and putting a camera, um, if you were to in the incidence of um fibroids, for example, um. Very often when somebody's going in for surgery, it's prepared and known what will be removed, or is it a lot of the time exploratory? Well, it depends. So it uh, depends on the pathology. So if if you are, yes, you can have diagnostic procedures. So for example, pelvic pain, or, you know, uh, some endometriosis noted in an ultrasound, you can go in, diagnose the laparoscopy, have a look, and that try to treat that endometriosis. A lot of the time, however, there will be something specific, an ovarian cyst, needs to be removed. Fibroids need to be removed. Cancer needs to be removed. Um, so you, and there are potential small variations to it, but overall, you know why you're going in, discuss it with your patient, discuss the complications, and, uh, and that's it. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. I'm 29. I, I wish. I have endometriosis. I don't wish. Uh, will I struggle to get pregnant and carry to full term? Will the endometriosis affect the baby in any way? Do I need to start trying now or can I wait a few more years? Bear in mind, we've, we've combined a few people's questions in these. Yes, okay, so endometriosis. Uh, endometriosis, there are three reasons why I I um, think it's a very important gynecological condition. So 10 to 20% of women will have it, number one. Um, I think it's at the currently terribly uh, looked after um, in the UK. Uh, there's a lot of dismissal here's a pill, go away, here's paracetamol, go away. Um, long waiting list to see a gynecologist, et cetera, et cetera. Um, why is it important? A, quality of life, painful periods, painful sex um, on a monthly basis that can become chronic and with the pain extending in between periods can have uh, a significant, uh, can significantly affect uh, a woman. Number two, there is a fertility aspect, and we'll come on to that. And number three, in some cases, endometriosis can progress to uh, to cancer, uh, rare. So then, you know, we'll put we'll put that aside for the moment. When it comes to f fertility, we do know that especially stage three to four endometriosis can cause blockage of tubes and can cause issues with conceiving. Once you conceive, once you conceive and you, you get past the first trimester, there is no problems and there's no effect on the baby. And actually, pregnancy is good for endometriosis. The hormonal menstrual cycle stops, it's blocked off, and endometriosis 
calm can calm down during during that um, during pregnancy. Um, with regards to conception, endometriomas these are of chocolate filled or chocolate color type ovarian cysts secondary to endometriosis can uh, there is some there is a lot of evidence now to show that they can uh, affect uh, conception. Uh, especially endometriomas that are above three centimeters. So um, it is if you are if you have painful periods of painful sex, please gynae gynecology one stop clinic. Get your blood test. Get an ultrasound scan. Have a consultation. Find out what may be going on. If you have had endometriosis in the past, and you've been diagnosed with it, and diagnosis is either with an expert somebody who's an expert ultrasonographer who, who can recognize it on scan or more commonly during laparoscopic surgery, and you have had good management hormonally, then um, uh, it is worth getting an ultrasound scan before you conceive, just to find out what the picture is uh, at, at that point. Um, the final question, do I need to start trying now if you, if you, have, uh, uh, if you have endometriosis? That's, I, I wouldn't answer that question based just on the endometriosis picture when to start is a is a very individual uh, question to answer where are you in your life how many children would you like to have what is happening with work um do you have a partner at that point and what does your partner feel so i wouldn't just base them that on endometriosis if the endometriosis is well controlled by well controlled periods are not painful sex is not painful the symptoms that you had in the past are now gone then um, that's great. Everything is under control. You want to start when you want to start. I wouldn't base it just on endometriosis. However, I would definitely get, uh, if conception is something that's going to happen in the next 6, 12, 18, 24 months, I would definitely try to get a general picture of what may be going on. Blood profile, anti-mullerian hormone levels, get a scan um, and have some confirmation. Right. And I think every, everyone is quite different. You could have endometriosis at a young age with a high ovarian reserve and you could have endometriosis in a, at a later stage with a lower ovarian reserve or vice versa. And I think, again, that's it's we we so want to put people into categories because it's easier to explain things to individuals if everyone is the same. But everyone is quite unique in their experiences, not only in how they manifest and tolerate symptoms um, in how they're struggling, but also in the manifestation of uh, the endometriosis within their body um, and that compounded with their ovarian reserve and further compounded with a partner's fertility, which is which is 50 percent of the equation. Correct. And just as we are on endometriosis, a couple of questions I can see in the in the chat. Zolodex and HRT for two years when waiting for surgery. That should not increase your risk of uh, cancer in comparison to not being on Zolodex and HRT. Getting that endometriosis treated is uh, is paramount. And that's a good example. Two years to get surgery. I mean, it's 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 depressing. Um, and there was another question. So if you don't, if you don't mind me, that's good. Uh, one was about excruciating pelvic pain. Um, I think chronic pelvic pain. This is ongoing pain that's lasting for more than six months. is a terrible burden on the NHS. Terrible burden for our women. Um, I uh, always look at these women through kind of through three angles. One, is there a gynecological problem? So what do the scans show? Is it to do with periods or not? And if it's to do with periods, like to be gynae, is, is there a sexual, is there sexual pain? So is, is there pain on uh, sexual intercourse? If it's, if there is, again, more likely to be gynae than not. If all that's negative and the scan's negative, I would then send those patients to a pelvic uh, physiotherapist um, to find out what may be going on there. A lot of the time, chronic pelvic pain can manifest itself with um, uh, different ways you sit, different ways you move and exercise, and it can cause inflammation on muscles. So a pelvic physiotherapist can definitely help, and you, you, some time needs to be spent with them. Number two, is there a nutrition angle? What's the BMI? What's the carb intake? Ideal BMI is 20 to 24 with high protein, a low carbohydrate diet. And the third person that I would see would be a gastroenterologist, a bowel specialist, um, to find out what may, what may be uh, what may be going on. Great, thank you. Okay, are you ready for the next question? This is yes. a, a, bar a barrage. 
I'm, I'm sure this and there's lo there's lots more. Um, but what should someone who's thirty years thirty two years old do if they believe they have endometriosis, which is undiagnosed, and they plan to have children in two years' time? I think we covered I'll say it again. One stop gynecologist clinic. So yeah, I, I, in an ideal world, every woman will have a a one stop gynecologist clinic uh, once a year. So one stop gynecologist clinic. If you believe you have endometriosis, I'm assuming because your again your periods are painful and sexual intercourse can be painful. Um, sometimes you, there can be pain on uh, on uh, going to the toilet for number one or number two as well, especially during during the period. This is tends to be with severe endometriosis. If you feel you have it, go to your GP or fertility, which offers the one-stop gynec clinic. The beauty of fertility is that it allows you to reach the gynecologist immediately. You speak to the gynecologist, um, get a plan going forward. That plan should include blood tests specific to endometriosis, a pelvic ultrasound uh, scan, and then let's see what that shows. Um, if the ultrasound scan points to endometriosis, we have the answer. If it doesn't, it doesn't mean you don't have endometriosis. You might have a mild version, which cannot be picked up on a routine ultrasound, uh, routine ultrasound scan. My advice to those uh, patients is, if, is, is to be started on a hormonal medication. First line treatment for endometriosis usually tends to be hormonal medication to dampen the hormonal effect on the endometrial tissue, which is found uh, in the pelvis. So you want to have children in two years time, it's fine. And it's endometriosis. If it's diagnosed hormonal medication, if it's stage three to four, you may need surgery and you therefore need to be seen by a gynecological surgeon. Um, if Nothing is seen on ultrasound scan, but the pain is only during periods, probably is mild endometriosis, and something hormonal would be, again, a good first line. Stopping that within a year or two, sorry, within a year, so about 12 months, and then 12 to 18 months, and then allowing yourself six to nine months of not being on anything, bring your cycles back, etc. Remember, it's not just about the hormonal medication. There is a quality of life aspect. High protein, low carbohydrate diet, good sleeping pattern, minimal alcohol, and looking after yourself uh, for your general health and your uh, pelvic health. And I think there's a lot of questions here asking about the NHS and will the NHS do it? Part of the reason why we feel so passionately about this is because the NHS is very much struggling. Um, GPs, even if they do refer you to see a gynecologist, there's um, wait lists of nine months to two years just to see a gynecologist. And to the point that we started with was Dr. Surgeon used to see people with stage three, four cancers. And that may, that may be an extreme, but when left untreated um, with a current health system that is very overburdened, people are not getting the treatment that they desperately need in order to um, reach the care that they deserve. And moreover, with fertility services, um, we at Fertility, we did a study looking at all of the different areas within the UK and all of the different care commissioning groups to see what was their uh, criteria for referral for NHS funded fertility treatment. You would think that it is the same across the UK. It is not. It varies by postcode. Uh, hence why people talk about a postcode lottery when it comes to fertility treatment and being referred for funded fertility treatment in different areas within London and the UK. Some will fund up to two, some will fund only one, um, some won't fund if you're above, or the majority won't fund if you're above a certain BMI, if you're below a certain BMI, if either you or your partner smoke, if either you or partner or your partner already have a child, even if it's from a former um, relationship. There are so many stringent criteria by which you have to adhere to, uh, to qualify for funded treatments so almost 70 percent when we look when we did a study looking at our data seeing all of the people who are actively trying to conceive for over a year how many of them would ever be eligible for nhs funded fertility treatment only 30 percent would be eligible for funded treatment and what's hard about hard about that is that they've waited a full 12 months to find that out and so they, they've they've wasted um quite a significant amount of their time trying so that's why we believe everyone should just check in uh, with their fertility test to see to check all of your reproductive hormones and we do this um at such an affordable price compared to Yes, we're not free. We're not the NHS. Um, we have research to feel our revenue fuels our research. Um, but the comparison for a fertility assessment through a clinic is 
exponentially higher or even going to a hormone doctor it's exponentially higher um and we take in we, we not only do the full panel of reproductive hormones but we also inter interpret and um, extrapolate what all of the results mean for you so um it's a one-stop clinic but you don't even have to go anywhere which is great okay so we actually covered this question already you must have looked through the slides before about the difference between pco pco and pcos um is it a concern if your ovaries sh are shown to be really close to your uterus lining on an ultrasound scan? I think this means close to your uterus. Yeah, it must be. Uh, yeah. I think it must be your uterus. It's not, it's not about being close. They can be close or not. It's, it's whether on an ultrasound scan by that somebody who knows how to do an ultrasound scan, whether um, they are adhered, whether they're stuck to the uterus. So ovaries can be stuck to the uterus because of endometriosis. So a stage three to four endometriosis type picture, or they can be stuck to the uterus because of previous surgery. Um, if, if, they're if the ovaries are stuck to the uterus, it may mean nothing, um, or it may be uh, a sign of one of those two things, which can then have an impact on fertility. For example, like we, like we discussed earlier, you know, stage three to four endometriosis, for example. Um, so it just depends on what the overall ultrasound picture is. It's not just about this one thing. So are there, is there any other evidence of endometriosis? Um, as the, and then obviously the clinical picture, has the patient had previous surgeries? What are her symptoms like, et cetera? So it, it, ovaries, it's like it's the whole concept of multi multifollicular ovaries or multicystic ovaries. Ovaries stuck to the uterus without anything else, you know, without... We, who, who knows? It's the whole picture that one needs to assess. But if I saw this, I'd be thinking previous surgery and I'd be thinking endometriosis. Great. Um, I think it's important to know the health of your uterus and your ovaries. And that's why we offer ultrasound scans. So in addition to the blood testing, what we learned very quickly, actually, was that in order to confirm a diagnosis for many of the different um, pathologies that we were screening for, whether it was polycystic ovaries, whether it was endometriosis, whether it was fibroids, actually, those are those obviously definitively do require a scan. Um, many, many of the symptoms can signpost some of those pathologies like um pelvic pain, um, intermenstrual bleeding, pain on intercourse. And so that's why we we actually were astounded to see that 47% of people who did a test with us actually really do have a clinical indicator for needing an ultrasound scan. So it's very important to not just leave it with your, your blood results, but to also um, have a scan with us. So why are my periods always irregular, no matter what I do to make them regular? Ever since I started my period at 11, I've had, I, I haven't had i have either had a period. It's been completely, or it's been completely different times. And actually, there's another question on the group saying um, that they've had irregular periods their, almost their whole life, but they've been told that that's actually their, their normal. Um, um, I think you, you've answered it in, some, in a lot of ways. First of all, I'd like to know the, the age of this patient. So um, if this is somebody who has a you know, first period, age of 11, and is still a teenager, um, hasn't reached the age of 20, this is very likely to be uh, a sign of normality. Um, irregular periods um, that are of a concern are, are usually women who have, have, who, have had who have had regular periods and then they become uh, irregular, okay? However, it still warrants an investigation. So seeing a gynecologist, what is the clinical um, picture like? What are the symptoms? Any other symptoms? Um, ultrasound scan, blood tests. Uh, it might be worth re just defining for everyone what what is defined as a as a normal menstrual cycle. What is defined as a normal period? So anything from twenty to thirty five days is usually uh, is is considered to be regular. Um, anything that's less than that or above that is considered either too short or too long. Irreg the, the whole concept of irregular periods is that you don't have a set standard. But the key here is that it doesn't necessarily mean a, uh, a pathology. However, investigations are always warranted. So I, I, I don't think they should be um, uh, just ignored. You know, have irregular periods, you, you know, one, one month it's 35 days, then the next time it's 42, then it goes up to 48, then it... And you know whatever I, it warrants an investigation, warrants a proper, uh, proper look in. Um, but for this specific question, the patient says I've started my period at eleven, 
and it's always been a bit irregular. So to me, the most important thing is what's the age of this patient? As I said, it's common for teenage uh, for teenagers to have irregular uh, to have irregular periods. The the one that you know, like kind of a little light bulb lights up is women who have regular periods every twenty to thirty days, thirty two days doesn't matter, and suddenly come to me four or five months of periods being all over the place, and then I always split the kind of the investigation: is this physiological, change in diet, change in exercise, stress levels, breakdown in relationship, whatever. And therefore, the periods have become irregular, or is there an actual uh, pathology? And the number one is that I always want to exclude is, as discussed so many times already, polycystic ovarian syndrome. I hope I hope that. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I think it's and it, it, sometimes in in the absence... questions. Some of these questions. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, we just we tried to take as many of the questions and and put to there. There were a lot of questions, so many. I, I think I think for the women that are listening, remember it's not it's a uh, it's. Every one of these questions is very individual. So you yes, make, of course, make I mean. this concept of you know, going to Google and Googling, and uh, you find all sorts of answers. It's very individual, very individual. And it doesn't necessarily, you, you can't fit any of these into a box and say, okay, this is what's going on. You need the full picture. What's your age? What's your BMI? What's the clinical picture? What are the other signs and symptoms? Past medical history, past surgical history. Let me do a scan. Let me do blood tests. There are so many questions that need to There's be so many. Let's There's so it. many questions <laughs> I need to answer. There's a, a, a lot in our current Q&A. Um, with, with that exact point that you just made, everything everything needs to be taken into account from a personal level. What, this is why I sound like a broken record, but um, we have dedicated many years, included so many experts, uh, Dr. Surgeon included, in ensuring that in our health assessment, our online health assessment, prior to the fertility test, we ask all of the relevant factors with regards to previous diagnoses, previous symptoms, any non-reproductive conditions that you might have. We know that autoimmune conditions are linked with endometriosis. You're one and a half times more likely, according to our fertility data, to also have um, a, an autoimmune condition if you have endometriosis. Um, and really using data to better inform people's outcomes. We look at all of your um, menstrual cycles, your lifestyle factors, lifestyle factors to really help us to inform what your clinical journey should be um there are septillion variables that have been taken into account <laughs> i didn't even know this number existed um until our data team came back i said how many variables are we actually dealing with um and there are so many to take into account but what's really important is taking your health into your own hands and saying actually i'm not going to be left on a waiting list i am going to be an advocate for my own health um, many people do suffer in silence and have to advocate to advocate advocate for themselves in an appointment and justify their symptoms. Becoming an expert or in in your own body um, shouldn't be hard, and that's why we've created fertility to allow somebody to at least be um, a driver in the decisions when it comes to their own healthcare and to better understand their own reproductive health, their hormones, their fertility, what stage of uh, perimenopause they may be in or menopause. And so, so many things with regards to symptoms will inform the clinical diagnosis. Um, Dr. Surgeon, are there any other questions within, I'm conscious that we have five minutes left, but I want to be able to answer. No, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, I'm happy to continue for a little bit longer. Um, it, unless, <laughs> unless we have to finish another. There, there, uh, um, there is a question around um, struggling yeah. with severe anorexia and being underweight there's also a question about somebody who hasn't had periods yeah. in 10 years with hypothalamic amenorrhea can i just say for the question about um anorexia and is there a chance i'll recover to a healthy weight would you be able to conceive one day there is a i came across an app called juniver j-u-n-i-v-e-r for eating disorders and it's a companion for people so check that out first um but what Dr. Sergio, we just spent two days at a gynecology conference uh, about sports and many of the sports athletes have um, periods stop as well as a result of exercise. Um, what's the evidence for periods returning once once normal BMI returns and fertility returning? And I, I, it goes back to the thing we were talking about irregular periods in the two pathways. Is it physiological? Is it pathological? If I've had a number of women with low BMIs, 15, 16, 17, 18, no periods, three, four, five, six months. I think there's a patient here. Sorry, patient here. Apologies for name patient. Well, one of the attendees has said that she hasn't had a period for eight months. Um, I 
the evidence is excellent. The first thing I always say is let's address the nutrition. Let's address what you're eating. Um, is this a sports uh, issue? Um, and the, the condition uh, is in women who are highly active, who do a lot of exercise. They don't have to be elite female athletes. They can just be women who are passionate about sport, exercise four, five, six, seven, eight times a day, a week, sorry. Uh, is known as REDS, you know, you, you know this, uh, Helen. So relative, relative energy deficiency uh, in sport. So plenty of evidence. First port of call, nutritionist. Let's sort out, let's sort out the food. Um, some other, I'm just looking at some of the other questions that, that have been asked. Um, there are some, some interesting questions. There are some that are specific to fertility, yeah, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. What type of food is advised? Um, I think well, fertility have an ex an excellent nutritionist that I I think it's worth uh, consulting. Um, again, very very uh, individual the answer to that question. I think a Mediterranean style diet, a high protein, low carbohydrate diet is always uh, a good starter. But a nutritionist. The great thing about seeing nutrition is that they can give you a proper plan that would agree with your tastes and what, what you think you can achieve, rather than me just saying, you know, don't eat sugar for two weeks and etc., <laughs> uh, etc. Et um... I think also on the diet, there's there's some uh, questions about the link with bowel and and I and I do think it's important to the here, here I am gonna I'm gonna after after holding up my after holding up my giant ovary. I'm now going to hold up, albeit that it's it's a pregnant woman. When we look at how, or if, if the if the baby isn't there, when we look at how close you know the bowel and the the uterus are. It's it stands to reason that we do get a lot of mix up between bowel and uterine types of symptoms. But there is a lot of evidence showing that the gut. My everyone's talking about the gut microbiome, um, but that our the our gut microbiome significantly impacts our. Um, ability to deconjugate estrogen and, and when you can't properly break down estrogen as a result of some of the sugars within your bowel and the, and the bacteria within your bowel it can create porosity which means um, kind of almost like a, a translation between the gut and the bowel and I think that is something that is very hard to distill into a single message but when we're given generic advice around um, improving our overall health, actually having tangible pieces of information around maybe if I improve my my gut health, um, this will actually have a significant impact on my overall ability to um, process estrogen and, and and that direct link between the porosity between our gut and our bowel as a result. Correct. Um, some other questions I can see here. Someone has asked about lets and cone biopsies. So obviously cervical smears, I cannot urge you enough to go and get your cervical smears regularly done. It's every three years here, here in England. So you know, in the United Kingdom, starting from the age of 24 and a half in England, at the age of 20 in Scotland. Um, the question, specific question here is about LETS and cone biopsies. This, this is abnormal smears that lead to further proposcopic assessments. Uh, if you've been referred for the same procedure uh, and you want to try for baby soon, the procedure itself will not, uh, the procedure itself will not affect you trying and will not affect you conceiving. However, uh, a further LETS, so if you were to have another LETS, there will be two, that can increase the risk of second trimester miscarriage, preterm labor, preterm rupture of membranes. What does it mean? When you conceive, at the age of 10, when, you know, when you're 10, 11, 12 weeks pregnant, you let them know at your booking appointment that you've had this done twice, and you know that you need to have cervical length measurements uh, going forward, especially from 12 to 24 weeks. To, the risk is that your service gets shorter as the pregnancy progresses. Another question is about um, years of painful periods being managed by birth control. Painful periods should not be managed over a number of years just by birth control. Either the birth control sorts it, i.e. the hormones sort it as a first line. If the hormones don't sort it as a first line, you need to consider other things. Do I need surgery? So have you had an ultrasound scan? Is there endometriosis? Is it severe? So do you need uh, laparoscopic surgery to treat endometriosis? If the scans are completely normal, you've, you've had ultrasound, maybe even an MRI, nothing to do with endometriosis, um, then you need to look at uh, other specialties. Have you seen the bowel specialist? Have you seen a pelvic physiotherapist? You mentioned painful periods specifically. You should have, you should have had a, a surgical management for this at some point. 
Uh, marina coil can work with endometriosis. So when we talk about hormonal medication to manage endometriosis, it can be anything from combined oral contraceptive pill, usually works the best, but will have more side effects because it's combined. Marina coil, which is just progesterone release uh, from the coil to the inner lining of the womb. Other avenues, progesterone implant, for example, progesterone in pills. So yes, marina coil can work. You need to find what is best for you. Again, as per, pre per previous question, if it doesn't work, you need to be seen by a gynecologist for consideration of laparoscopic uh, surgery. Urea plasma, so there's lots of questions about bacterial vaginosis. Um, a lot. It, remember, BV, some people say I have BV, BV. Actually, a lot of the time I find that women haven't actually had a test. They think they have BV. BV is diagnosed with from a swab. You need a swab and a result that tells you you have bacterial vaginosis, which can be caused by a number of different bacteria. Your vagina has a lot of bacteria within it, the so-called vaginal microbiome. Most of that bacteria is healthy bacteria and great for you. But that balance can change. It can change due to a poor quality of life, going back to the stress, exercise pattern, poor eating habits, whatever it, it may be. And the bad bacteria take over, it can cause bacterial vaginosis. How do you manage it? Yes, antibiotics, a probiotic for over a number of months, an oral probiotic such as Optibac or a vaginal one such as Canis Floor, and then uh, lifestyle changes. Washing once a day, drying with a hair dry cold hair dryer, no douching, no bathing, and then if it persists, getting your partner uh, tested. Uh, and if that doesn't work, fluconazole oral tablets. Urea plasma uh, specifically, I would consider uh, azithromycin as the antibiotic. Uh, anything else? There are so many questions. A lot, of, a lot of these we've we've, we've uh, covered. Um, heavy pain and bloating during your cycle in irregular periods is definitely not normal. Be the one-stop gynae clinic. See, speak to gynecologist, fertility operator, we've said a number of times. Gynecologist, blood tests, ultrasound. Those are the main three things. Plus, minus, smear, plus, minus swaps. But what you, this patient here, heavy pain, bloating during your cycle in irregular periods, definitely unlikely to be normal um anything else you're seeing here helen that seems of an interest yeah, i mean there's 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 so many questions it's actually very very hard and i think we should wrap up for um all okay, i want to keep going with him <laughs> um if we if I could just take a moment to thank you, Dr. Surgeon, for everything that you've done. And also just to mention um, that you are available to book consultations with. Um, I would highly recommend anyone to book a consultation. Uh, Dr. Surgeon gets incredible feedback for all of his consultations. He's a, he's a, a dedicated, diligent and very caring uh, practitioner. Um, an interesting fun fact about Dr. Surgeon is that he was part of the team that did the first uterine transplant in the UK, which shows you the, the depth and breadth of his surgical skills. So um, we're very grateful to have an hour of your time, especially in the evening, to answer so many different questions. I encourage anyone to book in a consultation with one of our team and to do a fertility test just to get to the bottom of your symptoms and to just be be the boss of your own body. And I hope this has been a good learning experience for everyone. And hopefully we can um, we can do some blog posts after on some of the individual questions that have been asked. But Dr. Surgeon, thank you so much for your time. And thank you to everybody who joined us this evening. Um, you take awesome. care. Thank you so much. Delighted to be here, honored to be here and look forward to speaking to all of you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Take care. Bye.